Over the past few decades, as the video game industry has been growing at a speed few other trades can match, prevailing wisdom and expectations on what defines a good game have risen. Thousands of games are released every year, and while almost all of them never find their way into public consciousness, those that do are often the pinnacle of quality, design, user experience, and most of all, entertainment. For many of us, video games have been a core part of our childhood and our generation has witnessed firsthand the numerous advances made to hardware, which allowed for better graphics, more gameplay features, longer gameplay, and of course, internet connection. In the early 2000s, average households were gradually obtaining access to broadband and Wi-Fi, subsequently giving them their first taste of the online multiplayer world. Usually it was through a massively multiplayer online role-playing game or MMORPGs like MapleStory, RuneScape, and World of Warcraft, as well as other online multiplayer titles like Counter-Strike, StarCraft, Roblox, and Club Penguin. What separated these titles from that of console or handheld games is that a Wi-Fi connection allowed for a malleable environment, also known as updates. Prior to that, the only way to get your hands on a video game was to physically get hold of a cartridge or disc with the game in it. Downloading was a thing in the early 2000s, but very few people had the bandwidth to import huge files, and consoles were much more powerful and optimized for gaming than PCs were at the time. Online games are pretty much omnipresent in this day and age. In fact, it would be harder to find a game that doesn't interface with the internet in some way, shape, or form. The beauty of this is that a game can continue to be enhanced, improved upon, and expanded with patches and software updates, all without requiring players to purchase a completely new version of the product. They could just simply download the newest update onto their already existing one. The inclusion of software updates was a massive quality of life benefit for both developers and players alike. As the former was no longer bound to the constraints of the traditional software release cycle, and the latter could enjoy a singular game for a much longer period of time, since new content and systems would be added consistently. All in all, the inclusion of updates was a win-win for both creator and consumer. Naturally, the one problem all video games faced in the day was that one way or another they would come to an end once you completed everything there is to do. You can only play the original Pac-Man so many times before you get bored of it. For the developers, it meant that you had only one shot to do everything you want and have everything you want. You had to plan ahead every feature, every function, every system in the game, design and develop it, and most importantly, make sure the game worked as intended. Because once that game was released, it was out. Well, you could just release an updated version, but it would have to be free because no one would want to pay for a brand new video game just for bug fixes and the like. This time limit forced many developers to conduct intensive, extensive, and exhaustive playtesting throughout a game's development to snuff out as many edge cases as possible. A lot of focus, and more importantly money, was placed on quality assurance before patches became widely accessible. That's sort of the whole point of innovation, attempting to make life as convenient and easy as possible. Far beyond just video games, the creation of smartphones, mobile broadband, GPS, laptops, Bluetooth, etc all creature comforts that many take for granted were fueled by the desire to make life more convenient. Updates and patches were some of the divining innovations for the gaming industry in that regard. But therein lies a situation where the strides made to improve were so convenient that they became the victim of their own success. If necessity is the mother of invention, then prosperity is the mother of complacency. Now that video games are no longer bound with only one in the chamber so to speak, there is also no longer that need to make sure everything is right and everything is there on the first try. Some might argue that's a good thing. It now frees the developers from the all-consuming strain of crunch time and alleviates the pressure to be perfect. After all, no matter how thorough developers are, they're only human. They can't possibly account for everything. All the same, it led to a noticeable decrease in standards for what constitutes a completed release. Publishers saw fit to cut corners on a game's development simply to get it out in the market as fast as possible, overlooking very egregious issues such as game-breaking bugs and glitches that could easily have been noticed with any semblance of playtesting. Unacceptably low and or shallow amounts of content, especially for games with full price tags of $60 to $90. Poor optimization to their engine and systems, resulting in even high performance hardware to struggle to run the game smoothly. And a very inconvenient and tedious user experience completely lacking in quality of life. These are some of many examples of serious mistakes noticed in certain games that had very poor releases. While infringing on any one of these isn't enough to destroy all hopes for a game's commercial success, it sets a precedent for what gamers can expect from the developer of said game going forward. The number of releases like this is still very much in the minority, but there have been several noteworthy cases where heavily anticipated games were launched way before they were ready for distribution. A practice many within the gaming community has dubbed release now and fix later games. The old software development cycle has been replaced by a new structure known as agile development, which in its simplest definition is releasing a product incrementally instead of all at once. 
In other words, since games can now be updated indefinitely, the old system of alpha, beta, and gold masters fell out of relevance because nowadays, the industry standard is to simply deliver the minimum viable product, the MVP, and then improve and upgrade it on it over time. Wikipedia defines minimum viable product as a version with just enough features to be usable by early customers, who can then provide feedback for future product development. In other words, it just has to work with the bare minimum features needed to be a recognizable product, which is basically a prototype. Now, credit where credit is due, adopting agile development as a business model opens up opportunities for developers to figure out if they're going in the right direction. After all, making video games is very expensive, with some of the big titles costing upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars. One of the most common practices is releasing an open or closed beta, where players are allowed premature access to a video game to playtest it and offer feedback on what works, what doesn't, and what can be improved on, which aid the developers in catching bugs and glitches. You can kill two birds with one stone this way, giving players a form of equity in how the game will be made, while also cutting costs on quality assurance and personal playtesting because you can have players do it for you for free, or in some cases they may even pay you to playtest your game. Another possible benefit is that the earlier you release a game, the sooner you can make a profit on it. Let's assume we're designing a game with a development cycle lasting 3 years till Gold Masters. That means you'll be going 3 years before even seeing a chance for a return on investment. But if you were to release it as a minimum viable product but market it as version 1.0, the time it takes for your game to reap the fruits of your labor dramatically shortens. That being said, the definition of an MVP is left to interpretation, which means releasing a product with too little opens up the possibility of a bad first impression. And to many people, first impressions are lasting impressions. A popular case of this is No Man's Sky, a game marketed to be an incredible open world experience with practically infinite gameplay due to its procedural generation. The game was arguably one of the most hyped indie games in all of the industry's history, but upon its release, many of the features the game advertised just did not exist. Performance was optimal to say the least, and there was a mountain of game-breaking bugs and glitches that sometimes made the game too unstable to play. Subsequently, players were quick to discard the game as empty promises and hollow words. Technically speaking, they did manage to deliver on the game's foundation, but there was just no substance to it. Over the past 5 years or so since its release, the game has improved tremendously according to reviews and coverage of the game, but because of its atrocious maiden voyage, the game's reputation has been permanently crippled to where it probably will never become a mainstream topic again since everyone thinks of No Man's Sky as one of the worst games of 2016. Begging the question, could it have done better if it simply waited through a year or two more of development before heavily advertising and marketing the game? A more recent example of a spectacular failure was the immensely anticipated Cyberpunk 2077. It didn't crash and burn nearly as hard as No Man's Sky, but was still an example of a game that promised much but failed to live up to expectations. Despite having been delayed several times, the game's rushed development led to a cascade of all four of the points I mentioned earlier. For disclaimer, I myself have never played the game, but after three hours of digging through articles and watching reviews, it was made very clear that too many oversights were made to quality assurance, content depth, storytelling cohesion, and technical optimization that ruined what would have otherwise been a brilliant game, probably one of the best games in 2020. Donkey sums up Cyberpunk pretty well and even makes a jab at the video game industry as a whole. Playing Cyberpunk right now is like playing an early alpha version of a game that is years from completion. This is like pre-early access. Sony is actually issuing refunds for this game and has taken it down from the PlayStation Store. That is insane. Releasing games early and then fixing them as time goes on isn't just talking about bugs, but also content. There could be games released that have amazing mechanics, graphics, and work perfectly fine in terms of functionality, but have too little content in the game because the developers either underestimated how quickly players would get through all of it, or because they overestimated how much they actually had for the game. Genshin Impact started off like this. It was a beautiful game with so much thought put into the mechanics, the character design, the environment, and the lore. Almost everyone who picked it up was totally mesmerized and instantly fell in love with the game. But it took not even 20 hours to complete the storyline, the side quests, and explore the entire world that was available. After that, there was unironically nothing to do. An absolute scarcity of content in a game so vast and beautiful People thought it was Zelda Breath of the Wild, but with Weeb fanservice, you got the best of both worlds. Now, Genshin is a gacha game, and I could make an entire video series criticizing gacha as a genre and an industry, but we'll work on that later. 
I understand that back then the only people who could release games were AAA companies with ample amounts of working capital and resources, and how very few indie developers had the wherewithal to pay for such extensive playtesting and quality assurance, but still had the talent and passion to release a memorable game that could touch the lives of millions of players, even if it wasn't the most polished and had a few janks. That would be a valid counter-argument, except ironically, most indie developers have greater respect and higher standards for a game's release than companies with twice the number of zeros in their war chest. So if anything, that point only makes it more unacceptable for companies to get away with this so many times. To the vast majority of players, experiencing release now fixed later games is the same as eating a burger's ingredients separately rather than all at once. No matter how good the buns, lettuce, tomato, onion, cheese, patty, and sauce are, individually they're not all that delicious. Only when they're all put together do you get to actually enjoy it. That's the main problem with premature releases, it feels like only half of the game is complete, and the developers promise the other half within a few months to a year. But by then, you've already chewed through the first half that, even if the gestalt of both halves results in an absolute masterpiece of a game, your experience is already tainted. An argument that might be made to defend companies for this practice is that even with multi-million dollar budgets, the rising cost, scale, and expectations of AAA games make it simply impossible to release a fully realized game with few if no defects. But again, the number of games that start off strong and continue strong past their initial release far outstrip that of the ones that release broken and need to be fixed. It's just the broken ones happen to be some of the most high-profile games in the industry's history. And any time a title under the radar has any form of controversy, it tends to relate to this as well. Hype from the public is a legitimate pressure imposed on developers, as even the smallest bit of marketing can lead gamers to inflate their hopes for how brilliant the game would be. Yet, a game needs to be aggressively marketed in order to reach as many players as possible, creating a commercial mechanism that is heavily exploitable because it offers massive short-term gain, something investors, venture capitalists, and corporate entities swarm around like moths to a flame. Technically speaking, AAA companies are doing nothing wrong. They are delivering a product in exchange for your money. When you pay the $60 price tag on a game, if you receive no less than the minimum viable product, the transaction is legitimate. It could be the worst product you've ever purchased, but it is still a product. Naturally, this practice is predatory in nature because companies can simply market a game, attract lots of attention and excitement, then exploit that to get as many buyers as possible, recouping your principal along with some profit, and then, if public relations is not a concern, which for Ubisoft, EA, Activision, and to some extent Bethesda and Take-Two Interactive, it clearly isn't, you could default on all the promised features and run with it. Big box developers are more inclined to pursue profit than product because in almost all cases, their war chest is funded by investors, most of which likely don't prioritize quality assurance and UX design as much as they do other aspects of the business. That's partly why community perception to corporate game studios have soured over the past few years, while support for indie games and developers has grown, since they now carry the spirit of game development that AAA developers used to have back in the 90s and 2000s, where it was less about raking in the most amount of sales possible, and more about releasing a good quality game that players will enjoy. A classic example of this is Super Smash Bros. Melee, widely considered to be one of the best video games of all time. What's special about this release was that the entire game had only 13 months of development time. 13 months to create a first playable, then an MVP, then an alpha version, then a beta version, then gold masters. Even though it was probably the most overworked 13 months of their lives, HAL Laboratory was able to create one of the most memorable games in history. Obviously with such a rushed development cycle there were quite a few bugs and glitches that slipped through the cracks, but most of them were just small little janks and edge cases that you could only find by randomly stumbling upon them, meaning 99% of players got to enjoy the game the way it was intended to be played. All advertised features were delivered on, and while the game was overall rough around the edges in terms of them as well as graphics, it was still a very polished game for its time. Fortunately, we still get to look forward to some amazing games that uphold the principles of design and development today, such as Ori and the Will of the Wisp, Persona 5 Royal, Animal Crossing New Horizons, Final Fantasy VII Remake, etc. But the number of high-profile games coming out like a car without an engine is rising, and since companies know that they're getting away with it, they'll continue to keep finding ways to cut corners. If we were to play devil's advocate for a moment, would not that mean it's the gaming community's fault for eating out of the hands of developers who are taking advantage of them? Yes and no. It would be our fault as gamers for being part of the problem by being easily swayed by advertising and hype, or willingly giving into your impulses to spend on a game despite knowing you're not getting your money's worth. But that might not be the right angle to look at it. 
Players don't spend money on games to support a predatory system. They spend money because they care about games. No Man's Sky acquired much of its hype because Hello Games was an indie studio trying to make a game that matched the scale and scope of most AAA games. Players rallied behind that underdog story in hopes that they could see it bear success. Cyberpunk has a very dedicated and loyal fanbase, and to see such an ambitious project for their series, it makes sense why they wanted to purchase the game. What I believe most big box studios don't seem to understand is that that's the beauty of the gaming community. It's not just about purchasing a product or service. Gamers care about the games they play. They're loyal to the games they play. Even if it may not be objectively worth spending X amount of money on a game, players do it because they want the game to succeed. They want the most out of it. Now while there's nothing wrong with that sentiment, it is important for us as players to maintain criticality. Yes, it's hard to resist the influence of hype and aggressive marketing, not to mention lovable characters, but it's still our choice whether or not we want to buy a game. All the same, the publishers are also partially at fault. Again, I'm not referring to the actual game developers and designers, they're just employees being told what to do. I'm referring to management and investors. Even if turning a profit on the game is your main concern, that is all the more reason why going above and beyond to produce a good quality product is so important. Too many companies opt for short-term gain despite being literally the least sustainable business model in any industry. You may be able to break even on your product, but if the grand opening is so abhorrently bad, it can actually cause irreversible damage not just for the game's reputation, but for the company's brand image. By building up hopes and expectations and then watching them come crashing down, you betray that trust. That's why even though usually, most broken games that come out eventually fix later, the damage is already done. Those who purchase a game on release will realize how terrible it is and dissuade their friends from purchasing the game as well. Which means you just missed out on potential customers and longtime fans who would likely purchase other games you made in the future. It does increase the amount of initial wherewithal you need to put into a game's development, but it also increases your potential for higher and lasting returns. I'm not saying games need to have 500 hours of gameplay, a billion features and pristine mechanics for the initial launch. Quality of life changes, new content, and bug fixes are what makes game updates so nice, because a game can be further improved on. All the same, a strong foundation needs to be there to achieve long-term commercial success, otherwise, the product image is permanently crippled in the eyes of the gaming community. Once again, first impressions are lasting impressions, and while just because a game has a rough start doesn't mean it can't be better, as the saying goes, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair a broken man. By doing it right the first time, you save yourself so many expenses performing damage control that it's practically the more financially sound decision in every way. This might sound like common sense to many of us as gamers, but there's definitely a lot of internal bureaucratic red tape that we probably aren't privy to. Being able to update and patch a game has done so much good for the gaming world because it allows developers the ability to improve a product and continue expanding on it when they couldn't have back in the day and players can continue to support developers while being able to enjoy a game they love more and more. But companies can also abuse this to exploit people for massive amounts of money, damaging the already tenuous trust between gamers and game studios. Not all release now fix later games have been made with bad intentions. Sometimes people underestimate the workload a large-scale game can take, and deadlines come sooner than anticipated. That's how game development is. But I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that some of the bugs or problems we see for these games are so egregiously conspicuous that it makes you wonder if they did remotely any playtesting whatsoever. There is a difference between an honest mistake, an obvious gross negligence, and a clear lack of care for attention to detail, and most players can tell the difference. There are some reasonable instances to where publishers cannot delay a game's launch and have to cut corners. For example, in the console universe where sales are heavily determined based on the cycle of a console, it's often why releasing games at the tail end of a generation and right before the next one is such a timely concern. Because, hypothetically speaking, if you were to make a game for the Wii U but ship it 3 months before the Nintendo Switch, no one would care to buy it because they're already thinking about the next big thing. Many titles are planned years in advance, so logistically speaking it's understandable why they can't just port it over to the next generation console since the game structure is already established with the features and performance of the current one in mind. Then there's the topic of competition. If two games were released at the same time and one was significantly more marketed and anticipated than the other, that could lead to a loss of attention for the lesser advertised game, which can also be the reason why indie developers might avoid holidays like Christmas. 
Too many external factors play a part in a game's launch date that it's not exactly fair to assume bad intentions by the game's management, so I'm not trying to make a case that all broken games were deliberately sold that way for the sake of cutting costs. That being said, release now fix later games are inherently a bad business model because it implies the game's fanbase and lifespan will survive long enough to actually be fixed, and it sets a negative precedent for studios to believe that they can cut corners, disregard playtesting, and procrastinate on critical elements of their game that should be prioritized first before anything else. It's both the responsibility of developers and players to be aware of this insidious practice, and do their individual parts to not let this take over and ruin so many games just to line pockets. AAA developers are still the elder statesmen of the gaming industry, and it sets a bad example for everyone else on what makes a successful game. The more players become aware of this, the more they can discourage these malpractices, and the gaming industry hopefully will be all the better because of it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed today's discussion topic. I know it's a little different from my normal content, but I have a lot of ideas for videos I want to make about video gaming industry in general, including videos about game design and development, so I hope you're okay with seeing more of this type in the future. There's a huge language barrier, so to speak, between gamers and developers, which has contributed to the rift between the two parties, and a lot of channels have made strides to close that gap, such as Game Maker's Toolkit, one of the best channels for educating everyday people on game and level design, as well as breaking down the intricacies of game production. They have so many amazing videos, and I'm a huge fan of their work, so if you're interested in learning more about this while I make more videos, go check them out, I'll leave a link in the description below. Let me know your own thoughts about release now, fix later games, or games that launch way too early than they should. I know many players have strong opinions on this kind of practice, so it would be interesting to hear what you have to say in the comments. Aside from that, a rating would be much appreciated, and if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel and more will be on the way soon. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for the next episode. Take care.